hello everyone. It's such an honor to be here. I'm so thrilled. And I'm so thrilled that there's finally a CSOUND conference. Um, and thanks to Joachim Heinz especially for being the first and for all that he's done for CSOUND. His instruments are amazing. I'm learning a ton of new tricks from both him and Alex from this fantastic CSOUND Floss document that collectively came together and is absolutely the sequel to the CSOUND book, but we're going to fix that, I hope. We might have a sequel to this book coming, but I'll tell you about that in a minute. Um, uh, just thank you, Joachim, for, for this, and I'm sure we'll be thanking you today, tomorrow, and for many, many uh, years to come, both of you guys, for putting this together and the whole team. Uh, it's really amazing and, and really great to be here. I'm so thrilled to be in this room with all of you who've made such great contributions to C sound and um, made it so great as a language and as a as a tool to teach and learn and for us to be able to kind of play it's so much better now than it was and we're in a position now to really play these instruments and play with this software um, uh, and I'll show you a little of that you'll see a lot of it tonight in the concert I'll even play a little something uh, now to warm us up, I think that would be best, and it's a song that I wrote that I sing in German, so now this is the worst part because I'm in Germany, and uh, you know, I can say this in other countries because no one knows if I'm pronouncing it so terribly or not, but, um, but I thought it would be fun to start that way, and then uh, where I'm going to take you uh, a little bit, and I'll certainly tell you some nice stories about how C-Sound got going, about my relationship with John Fitch, which is amazing, and uh, I know that C-Sound is written by Barry Burko, and it's true, and Barry and I are great friends, and uh, he's now uh, um, working on the OLPC project, and uh, he's in, um, I believe, New Zealand and Austria, where he's uh, distributing $100 laptops, which are bringing C-Sound to the world. This project is still alive and is a very big uh, project. In fact, uh, I bought uh, an OLPC laptop for Joaquin. This is yours. Oh, this one is called Joaquin. <laughs> you have to name them, and it, it's one of the new ones. I have the power cord too, don't worry. That's for later. I mean, I brought mine, which I will show you in a minute, but it is true that it's amazing that, you know, here's, uh, here's Trapped, which I wrote in 1979, and uh, Music 11, oh no it's not, this isn't Trapped, this is Stephen Yee's uh, Cyclic Bells piece, which I love very much, hi Stephen Yee. But isn't it nice that these little hundred dollar laptops, and there are millions of them all around the world, that the main synthesizer is CSAM. And they've got mesh networking and Wi-Fi, and they're a little slow, but they're amazing. The technology and the uh, interface and the graphics is what all of the little e-readers are about. They invented this uh, in the ink technology or whatever it's called, so you can see in sunlight. Um, you know, they're a phenomenal uh, little system, and it does play track too, and, and all kinds of pieces. And there's Tam Tam on here, and a bunch of wonderful apps. Victor Lazzarini, my collaborator in crime on the audio programming book and on future projects to be announced in the future, um, uh, uh, also wrote some amazing software for this. Many of you guys have seen that in. Um, in uh, the Linux Audio Developers Conference, and if you haven't, um, you know it's really wonderful that we can play, you know, any piece like this. I don't know that all of these young children around the world aren't getting incredibly frightened when they listen to Trap and Convert, and uh, 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 they probably have deleted it from most of the uh, 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 systems, but because uh, it scares the little children. But in fact, uh, there's no such thing as scary music, right? And the bottom line is we've been conditioned to hear music and to exclude all kinds of musical possibilities that most of us know are quite beautiful and quite amazing and quite phenomenal. There are many colors that have been excluded from our palette because of bias or television or movies, but you know, it's amazing that this $100 or $110 thing is, uh, is happening. Now, the future, of course, should bring C-Sound to our iPads, and I'm going to use the iPad quite a lot to control C-Sound. And at the end of my talk, I'll show you a little bit of my students are now converting software from the audio programming book and from C-Sound itself into standalone iPad apps. So I'll show you some of that, that we're starting to make the move to touch and tablet computing and to run C-Sound on our Androids and things like that. I think some of you will inform me that you've made progress in that area. But the bottom line is that, you know, this little 
$100 uh, box is pretty amazing, and it's really where we're at, that our, our C sound language, which we've grown and developed and contributed to, is now sort of really usable everywhere. And to make it more usable everywhere is certainly one of my new agenda issues. Uh, I did a, a conference with Victor some years ago, and my presentation there was about mainstreaming C sound. And I know it's wonderful to be uh, exclusive and elite in, in many ways and know that we're special, but we all are special. But one of my main things, advice to you and goals for you is that I want everyone to have C-Sound and I want everyone to be able to get it to work, get it to work instantly. I want them to get instant gratification that that just is there, it installs, and that they can use it and make music with it. They can make music with it with Logic and Live and Max and expensive and overcharged commercial programs that people buy and use and you probably buy and use as well. So I want CSound to work with everything. And that's like my, it should be certainly one of our goals, but certainly th that's a, a big part of my agenda because I don't want anyone who comes to it to be turned off by it. We all know how great it is as a language. We all know what it does to our minds, what kind of sound world it opens up to all of us, how it's allowed us to do incredible research and discover and explore and specialize in all kinds of areas. I, I just want everyone to kind of get that, uh, as many people as we can. We've helped in that way. The Floss Manual now is an amazing new document. The C Sound book was a good document to begin with. CSounds.com helps, tutorials that have come along. The C Sound Journal is amazing. Stephen Yee and James uh, Heron's efforts there are unbelievable. Jake Joaquin, who couldn't be here, his C Sound blog was a blast. And, and was really a, a fantastic thing. He's now em, embroiled that into something even more inclusive. So um, I'm, I'm really all about that. Now, is Ian McCurdy here? Ian I've, yeah. never, Ian, I've never met you. I brought you one of these $100 laptops, too, because I'll, this one is called Rick. I'm sorry. But this is mine. I wish I had one for all of you. <laughs> but I don't have that many. I only have now a few more at home. Um, I managed, before I finished all the sound design work I was doing at OLPC, to say, you know, if you gave me like a dozen of those, I could really get them to the right people. So these are two of the right people. Um, Ian's sound library uh, is also an amazing document, as all of you know. Uh, his real-time instruments are an amazing inspiration. It's such a comprehensive and huge collection. When they worked with just FLTK front ends, they were a, certainly a reason to keep FLTK in C sound. Because there's always been a dispute whether you wanted the graphic front end in C sound. And man, that whole Ian McCurdy collection was like, well, that's why you have FLTK in C sound. Those instruments were cool, they worked, and again, they allowed students who don't know C sound, anyone who's just turned on by sound but likes to push and explore and learn with their ears first. Musicians learn with their ears first. So when it doesn't work, you've lost a musician. Because they're maybe gonna read the manual. But why wear the manual when I've got all this other stuff that does work? So it's gotta work, and they learn with their ears. And so Ian's instrument collection, boy, uh, talk about selling C-Sound. I mean, that's just an amazing thing. And every time another one of his instruments came up, I was raving about it, I was drooling over it, I was showing it off in all my classes, and just loving it. And I don't know that you have any use for a little old PC laptop, but now you can set up an internet thing <laughs> with Joachim and do mesh networking, and who knows. And um, now, as, uh, as, uh, as Victor has shown me, um, OOPC even distributes all their software. So even though I haven't brought you all OOPC laptops, you can get their whole system on a stick now, and you can actually boot your Windows machines in the OLPC software and run all the stuff and write things. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of Art, Art Hunkins has been one of those, just those guys. I got him one of the OLPC laptops and got him to develop in his retirement, and he was always writing all of these interesting, kind of religiously inspired C sound pieces, all with biblical quotes. So I think he loved the evangelist part of the OLPC, but like it's been his new mission, literally, to continue writing pieces for the $100 laptop and getting them out there. So uh, of all of us C sounders now, I still see him as maybe the most active OLPC uh, developer, but I think that certainly any of us could be. And that's this reaches to this outreach that Joachim was talking about. 
Um, yeah, I do want to play a piece. So let's have a little music first. I'll play you this thing. And so then after we can maybe laugh about my super mispronunciation of some German words. Um, it's a beautiful piece, uh, a solemn song for evening. Uh, the second movement is Andante. It has uh, certainly some of the spirit of, of uh, uh, what I believe in in music and life. The poetry is by Hermann Hesse. I speak some of the translation in English, and I sing the uh, uh, line in German. It's in the Pierce scale, which was great because C-Sound let me play and explore the Pierce scale. I wrote this and dedicated it to Marjorie Matthews, who did the translations for me, Max Matthews' wife. Um, uh, tonight we'll be actually playing some pieces dedicated to him, and this morning, I'll, today, this, this evening, I'll show you a couple of Max Matthews moments. Uh, because we do come from him and his language. Um, and he is the father of many things, but he's also the father of open source. Max Matthews gave away everything he ever created, and he gave us all copies. He, he was a, an amazing example, uh, 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 for sure. Um, so uh, let's uh, just bring up the system. I'm using, uh, 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 for the first time, and you're now hearing it for the first time, C Sound for Live. Uh, which is a big uh, C sound package that I put together with a student of mine, Coleman O'Reilly, uh, which uh, essentially brings all of C sound and then about 200 instruments with GUIs into the live program. I haven't told Oyvind about this yet, but, but um, um, I think he'll be happy about what he sees. And because um, uh, Oyvind, as you know, has released a beautiful product, an amazing product called Hadron. And I've been uh, using his product with. Uh, in a big piece I did for Barry Verko's, uh, for the 150th anniversary of MIT, where I remixed Barry Verko's Synapse using uh, Oyvind's uh, system. But what we've done is we've built a whole bunch of things, and I'll do a workshop on this later, but it's allowing me to sort of play pieces that I had composed uh, for the radio baton over the years that I could never play in C sound, or it would take me uh, six months to get the C sound version right, and uh, instead I'd just move on and write another piece. So it's actually finally brought all of my repertoire uh, to the radio baton up and all, uh, 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 all my radio baton repertoire to C sound itself. So um, let me uh, uh, just uh, uh, load this up and, and try this song for you. Um, and uh, that will warm us up, or warm me up anyway. Um, although, does it seem like I'm not warmed up? Uh, now, um, the deal is that um, I want to be able to play C sound. Uh, and uh, I don't want C sound to have any limits. Um, let's see if this works. So the crickets are also in the Boland Pierce scale, which is kind of nice. And these are Hans Michelson's crickets. I don't know if Hans is here, I don't think so, but boy, he designed 100,000 great sea sound instruments. And um, Hans's uh, e-magazine for many years was quite an amazing document too. I still recommend that all of you go back and read it. Um, so we're in the Pierce scale. So there's no octaves in the Pierce scale. Ever and again consoling. And always knew in the splendor of eternal creation, the world laughs in my eyes. Butterflies in the sunny wind, sails swallows in the blissful breeze, streams the flood tide on the rocky strand. Das und endlich 
chame Not understood My way leads me to a lost blue distance Nowhere is there meaning Nowhere an assured goal But still every woodland brook talks to me Every humming fly speaks of deep law Of sacred order whose heavenly arch stretches over me as well. Procession of the stars resonate here too in the beat of my own heart. kid, a songwriter, um, uh, into the same world as a soundscaper or, uh, you know, someone sort of working with granular textures and just interested in painting with sounds and sound colors. And so, you know, we'll jump to just a little experiment in that domain. Um, uh, we're not actually playing this piece because it still isn't quite working as a piece, but um, I wanted to show it to you. Um, uh, one of my students, uh, Coleman O'Reilly, and I have been uh, working on a lot of projects together, and um, we call this trap hat and convert, and like play on the iPad idea. My password, by the way, is 1111, in case any of you find this lying around. Um, and um, so the whole idea here is I'm using Touch OSC, which looks a little bit like a lemur. Oyvind's going to jam with us later at the end of the concert, and he's got his lemur there, and I love the lemur. But I was really happy when the iPad kind of gave me some of that capability. It doesn't give me all the capability. And I will tell you that a lemur controlling C sound is heaven. I love the multi-ball, and you drop that into a granular patch, and it's pretty great. Multi-touch makes a big difference in sound design. All of you have probably started to experience this with tablets and the like. It, it's quite amazing. So I've launched Touch OSC. I'm going to launch uh, Cute C Sound. Now, one of the sad things about the conference is uh, Andreas won't be able to make it, and uh, so I was hoping to hang uh, with him, but uh, we certainly can't uh, forget to mention how amazing Cute C Sound is and what a huge difference it's made uh, uh, to all of our uh, uh, students and to all of us in terms of what, uh, what kind of capabilities it brings to the table. Now, um, oh, I hope my internet's all still working. So um, what we did was we tried to build, it's okay there, uh, we tried to build a kind of remixer with the iPad so that, so that I could, uh, you know, sort of turn on some things and use particle and sound warp and different things to sort of play uh, some of the samples. Let's see, are we back up? Mm -hmm. Come on, baby. Okay, hold on. Yes. So, you know, the whole idea that, you know, we can play and do sound design and have a little fun. So, you know, we'll bring up some of the C sound sounds. And, and you're going to actually hear some of these in the concert in the glove piece that I'm doing, John's playing in, and that we'll have all of you improvise with uh, sort of at the end of the show. But I can sort of call in players, and I can uh, 
uh, then sort of add sort of processing and and uh, sort of trigger them and mix them and granularize them and speed change them and pan them around and trigger others and I have all kinds of banks of sounds and some delays and reverbs and all kinds of stuff. But you get it. So it's a kind of remixer's heaven. But, um, and again, how's... So you see why I'm not playing it in concert. We're getting a little bit of turbulence there. But you get the idea. So it's built a whole sort of nice interface for me. I mean, if you guys want to try it, I can just pass it around. And you can jam on it while I get the, the rest of the keynote going. So, um, so you know, the, the little squares play single events. And some of the bigger squares turn on loops. And some of the sounds in the subsequent pages, pages are up here. And some of the sounds in the upper pages, um, you know, here's your mixer at the end here. I'm not sure I like the ergonomics of this design, but you know, to kind of get to the mixer, you have to jump to the last page, and then you want to play up here. So you end up jumping around a lot, but you know, you can sort of play it. And pages are up top to get the different screens, okay? And then just pass it on for a second, and we'll make it a little softer while I um, bring up some other things. So you get the idea that. Um, and some of the more immediate controls, it's like I said, it's a little tricky. Uh, uh, there you go, you're getting something to happen there. So, okay, let's get back to the keynote. Oh, I screwed you guys. Hold on. You're coming back. Count on me to hit the wrong button. It should be back. Uh oh, I have to do something else. Hang on. Where is it? I'll get it right back. You gotta kind of recycle the, the mixer when you sort of restart the instrument, I think. Let's hope. Yeah. Okay. So that's it. Okay, so let's see. We just want to hide it, it's still playing. Okay, good. Now, the keynote. So you know, I started doing C-Sound in 1979 at MIT at the summer program, Barry Verko summer program. Uh, before that, I was a visiting composer at Colgate University where I worked on uh, Music 10. Uh, and I worked with Leyland Smith's <coughs> language. They had a big mainframe there. There weren't many computers in the United States that had digital analog converters on them at the time. Colgate was one of those places. Stanford was another. MIT was a third. But and I think Illinois had one and Toronto had one. There were about five converters in the world or something. Maybe you're coming. So no one had access to any of these tools. Um, and uh, uh, I was lucky enough to uh, have, through friends and channels, I had had some things that were commissioned. And so um, uh, I managed to get invited as a visiting artist to Colgate. There at Colgate, I worked with Bruce Pennycook, who gave me some of his secret instruments. I talk about these a little bit in the intro to C-Sound book. But he showed me how to do stereo panning. He showed me how to do global reverb. And he showed me how to make a great bass sound which he called low. And so I always had one killer that just rattled the room in my pocket. And so when I went to MIT from Colgate that same summer, well, I already knew computer music. You know, everyone there was just kind of learning. I knew how to make a big fat bass sound and I knew how to pan sounds. And so I had a little stereo reverb action going too. So I had, like I was a superhero there because everyone else was just trying to get a sine wave to come out and I had some sound. But also, I brought with me, when I got involved in C-Sound and why I loved it, I had been working for the ARP synthesizer company, even as a young uh, student. It just turned out that my middle school teacher quit teaching and joined ARP to be their product specialist. And he sort of brought me along as this whiz kid singing songs with him and playing with synthesizers in the 70s, uh, early 70s. And so I got to know Alan Perlman. They commissioned my first symphony for synthesizers and orchestras. I kind of thought I was going to make it at that point. I was 19. I had a symphony played, a couple of big orchestras around the United States, and then there hasn't been a symphony. You know, I mean, it was like at 18, I thought it was going to happen, and then, you know, nice. It actually happened a few more times, but not enough to build a life on. But in any case, that Alan Perlman connection helped me get some synthesizers, start to think about sound design. And when I went to MIT, at last in C-Sound, I had my biggest ARP 2600 I could ever imagine having. So on your ARP, you only had one filter, I could have 40 filters. On your ARP, you had three oscillators, I could have 3,000 oscillators. And so I was in heaven. I was already used to making sounds and thinking about making sounds. And so I finally was given, at the time, Music 11, 
and I was able to sort of make sounds in that world. That's kind of how I got started and, and sort of went from there. And of course, the first thing I realized was that Barry Verko's manual was impossible to learn anything from or read. He and I have become very good friends, and I've certainly told him that in those same words many times. And he turned to me once with his kind of smile, and he said, well, Richard, it's, it's not a user manual. It's a reference manual. It's to like remind experts about you know what knobs do or whatever. You have to be an expert to kind of understand every page of that manual. That was his approach, it was to remind him what his opcodes did. But he understood everything about them. He just needed to remember, oh yeah, it's P6 is that. Well, the third parameter is that, the fourth argument is that. As a matter of fact, if you read his Music 360 manual and you just read the oscillator page, um, it's quite amazing. Uh, um, uh, let's see, I've got the Music 360 manual uh, scanned in. Uh, this is the one I started using Music 360 in 1976 uh, uh, or so down in Richmond, Virginia with Lauren Carrier. He was one of my, imagine this, my electronic music teacher's last name was Lauren Carrier. And <laughs> the guy I teach with at Berkeley now, one of the professors there is named Chris Noyes. <laughs> I swear to God, he hasn't changed it. It's just like, so, um, you know, my name is just filled with bull and anger. You know, but, but uh, these guys are, uh, I've got much better, better uh, uh, names. Now, but in Barry Virgo's manual, the 360 manual, if you look up even like the oscillator or something, it's, it's pretty amazing. Let me see if I can find it. Um, ORC, and ORC, declare. And you see, he hand typed it. Tape in, tape out for going to mag tape. Um, and because Music 11 grew out of Music 360, and Music 360 grew out of Music 5. Um, and we're lucky to have all that Music 5 stuff still. Come on, I think Oscillator Page is next. Uh, line, Expon, Linseg, they're still there. They were there. Awesome. Okay, ready? I'll read it to you. Because, you know, believe it or not, the Music 11 manual got a lot better than this. But here's Oscill. Oscill, Amp, SI, IFU, and iPhase. So it looks kind of familiar to all of us. But here it is. Table IFN is sampled modulo 512 with increment SI and the value obtained is multiplied by amp. Now, for a kid who's just used an ARC 2600 or a Moog, whatever, and has played with an oscillator, I don't know what you would exact, I mean, you'd probably put some numbers in and figure it out. I mean, if that's amp, then the other thing's gotta be something, but I don't think they would understand sampled modulo 512. And so, you know, a big effort of mine in uh, uh, 1979, I made Trapped and Convert that summer. Trapped and Convert is the first C sound piece because I came back to the MIT Media Lab after my PhD, Barry had invited me. I was actually running secret uh, Music 11 jobs at UC San Diego where Dick Moore had written uh, C music. And um, uh, um, you notice I didn't write the C music book though. And so you might read into that what you will about my relationship with my thesis advisor, Dick Moore, and the C music language. I wrote the first C music piece too. It was played at a, a computer music conference. And in fact, Dick Moore is great. His computer music book is wonderful. It teaches a lot of C programming. I think our audio programming book is thrilling and, 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 and new. And, and in fact, I'm happy to tell you, Victor, that I, I was at Max Matthews Memorial and hanging out with Dick Moore all day. And he was so thrilled that we had dedicated the book to him. And, and uh, um, uh, uh, Dick Moore actually said, and you know, Rick, I'm using your book. I'm teaching with your book in my classes now. So it's kind of nice. So uh, I, think, I think we did a good thing, and, and uh, uh, he's a great man. But um, we had a PDP-11 at UC San Diego where I was doing my PhD in the computer room. We had a VAX 11780. That's what we did C music on. That's what we sort of pushed uh, uh, things further. But we weren't running C sound. But Barry came and visited one day, and he gave me the mag tapes. And we had a PDP-11 that wasn't doing anything. So we installed Music 11 on there. So at night I would be running Music 11 jobs and writing them onto disk drives that were little refrigerator sized things and we'd put a platter of disks in and, and write, write uh, onto there. I had my own disk, my own hard drive. It cost thousands and it really was quite a beautiful uh, refrigerator. Um, and so I was doing some Music 11 stuff still at UC San Diego. So when I graduated, I came back home. I, I'm a native of around the Boston area. My bachelor's degree was at New England Conservatory in Boston. In fact, I lived right across the street from the Berklee College of Music when I was an undergrad. And the drummer in my band was from Berkeley, but I never hung out at Berkeley. I never thought I'd end up at Berkeley, but I'm glad I did. Uh, the students there are amazing, and Berkeley is 
has contributed a lot to see sound too in a in an indirect and a direct way. My student Parasmaragdis added MIDI to see sound. You know, he added granular synthesis to C sound. Um, he made C sound for the first time play in real time and write AAF files. And just from Berkeley, an untrained non computer science type. I'm excited about that given that I'm not a computer science type, and maybe some of you aren't. Barry Verko never studied computer programming with anyone, and those of you who know the code might say, oh, that explains it. But, uh, but in fact, he's not a studied computer scientist or computer programmer. Max Matthews never studied computer programming with anyone. Uh, and uh, um, uh, uh, so that, you know, our whole field is built by scrappers, uh, musicians who wanted to make these things make music. And so um, uh, there's hope for all of us in our group and in our field. But, um, you know, here's the original Music 11 manual that I worked with. and. Uh, um, you know, it's, uh, it's about 43 pages long. And uh, it too is still pretty thorny, but it's got more operators, tables, and oscils. And Trapped and Convert was written uh, on this uh, system. Um, when I came back from UC San Diego, uh, uh, Barry invited me to come to the media lab. So I would get up at four every morning. I would drive to MIT, I'd meet him at six. He started at six. The lab was empty, it was just him and I in the whole building. And we worked on, at the time, C sound. And we would work from six till, um, uh, you know, two or three or four o'clock, and then I'd go home. And uh, um, so it was really pretty great. Uh, the nicest thing about that whole experience is my son Adam uh, just graduated with his PhD from MIT, from the Media Lab. Um, he was in Todd Macover's group. Todd and I have always been. Uh, where we actually have been good friends, but we've also have been competing about alternate controllers and hyper instruments, as you might well imagine. And, uh, and Todd was a great thesis advisor to my son. And uh, my son's work has been in music, mind, and health. And he's been using C sound and building toys for stroke victims and, and quadriplegics and doing all kinds of alternate controller things, baton-like things, to allow people to make music who might have physical or mental cognitive disabilities. So he just finished his PhD this summer at the Media Lab, which is pretty great. We've always been connected. A bonus of that that I'll tell you related to C-Sound is the following. Um, last Christmas, Adam gave me the tape recorder that I recorded Trapped on. Still works. It's an Otari two track. It was in Barry's office, and Barry was retiring and getting rid of it. And he said, does anyone want this recorder? And so it's the actual reel-to-reel -reel unit. So it's in my studio now. and. Uh, I'm really excited to have uh, have my uh, my almost my whole trapped system in place. What I need now is in my basement, you know, a Vax 11, 780 or something. But uh, I don't know if my wife would go for that. But I'm I'm glad to have uh, have the old recorder. Um, so Barry would invite me back. We'd be alone in the lab. I had my own little office there because the lab space wasn't taken up. And I'd go every day, and we'd work, and we'd sit, and we'd run trapped, and we'd test it with his new language, C sound, um, and. Uh, 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 C-Sound was, uh, you know, a, a great project of his, and um, he finally, uh, you know, got a manual together. This is my manual from back then. You know, like, syntax of score is unclear. Wait, what is a function? S-rate thing, arbitrary, set it yourself. Revise 2.5 to better understand LIDSEG. Introduce some simple ones. So this is all my scribbles to try to make the manual or my parts of it clearer. And it was really a thrill when Barry added my tutorials to the manual that I wrote in, in uh, 1990, my, my basic toots that just kind of get you going in, in uh, 10 minutes and sort of show you the basics of C sound. It was my first shot at writing sort of tutorials about the language. Now, together we sat, we worked at analog devices trying to make karaoke systems and embedded systems, essentially C sound on a chip. That's where we met Oyvind, and uh, uh, we met many other developers who were working and connected with companies that might want to think of ways of getting CSound onto systems and into hardware. CSound finally ended up in a giant karaoke box that Taito used. They sold lots of them. It's kind of corny. I spent a lot of time um, uh, modeling all of the Roland SC88 sound canvas instruments in C sound, built the whole library so that the 5,000 karaoke arrangements that had already been done for the sound canvas could now run on C sound on that chip. 
So Scotty Verco, Barry's son, and I uh, worked on this project together. And um, uh, it was kind of a nice thing that I'm the one who taught Barry's son C sound, which is sort of nice. And it uh, uh, was a nice thing. And both my, my son and Barry's son ended up at the Media Lab together working on their masters and PhDs, which was kind of cool. I was Scotty Verco's, one of his thesis advisors, when he finally did his uh, thesis uh, there at the lab. Uh, and he also worked on the $100 laptop project. But in any case, this is where I started writing this. And <clears throat> from the beginning, I was thinking there needed to be a better manual. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you just a tiny bit of the manual story. Then I'll show you two more things about the future, and then maybe I'll stop. Um, but I have uh, uh, over-prepared because I actually, I'll show you all the things that I prepared to talk about. And then we'll just show you what they were. And then we'll just say a few words about the future. And, and, uh, and we'll see how you feel. I can certainly go on. But um, the manual. So Barry's manual was printed out on some special postscript printer. And it was written maybe in latex or some language that Unix guys like John likes and, and all this. And I actually wrote my doctoral dissertation in such a language. And it was interesting and great. And it allowed my laser printer to format a beautiful document. But about 1990, we all had uh, laser printers, and we were all using Microsoft Word or whatever, or Open Office or Open Something to write documents. And no one could read the manual. Again, it was like shutting people off with C sound. So I spent $1,000. I bought a scanner. At the time, they weren't cheap. Now they come with everything. Um, uh, by the way, I don't have a lot of money. Uh, I'm dressing like it now, but I don't. I'm down, my bank account went to zero as I came to this trip. So, so I'm not made of money by any means, and it was hard. I squeezed out $1,000, or I t put it on a credit card or something. I bought a scanner. I scanned the entire manual, his postscript manual. Then I OCR'd the whole thing. I hand-corrected all the pages, every single page of the manual, so that we had a Microsoft Word document at the end of my spring break. That was my spring break that year, was spending the whole week 20 hours a day scanning that manual. That's the manual that you guys started with. Now, in 1990 and 1991, I was glad my tutorials were in there. It still wasn't good enough. And, and that's when I started to think, wouldn't it be nice to write a C sound book? Um, uh, and I said, Barry, how about if you and I write a C sound book? And he said, yes. I went to his house. We signed a contract. We got MIT Press on board. And Barry and I were going to write the C sound book. We were working at uh, analog devices at the time on the karaoke system. And Barry got really, really busy. And I got really, really busy. And also, I realized, and I, uh, I hope that this level of honesty is OK with you guys. But I realized I was way not smart enough to write a CSAM book. I didn't know LPC well enough. I didn't know phase vocoder well enough. I knew some things. I knew how to write my tutorials. I knew how to get it working. I knew sound design. But there were all kinds of areas of CSAM that I did not understand or know well enough to pretend to be the expert to write MIT Press's book. Now, I thought having Barry on board would have worked, but it turned out Barry wasn't, didn't have the time in the end to write. And in fact, we drafted up a new contract, and he agreed to write a chapter or something in the CSAM book, which he wrote about his spectral data types. And so I ended up getting a chapter out of him, but he didn't write. At that time, I had made friends over the years, and I'd started to make friends at conferences and places that I had played. So I started to call on them and saying, you know, uh, Russell Pinkston, who had figured out and made these beautiful instruments that did reinits and stuff. I said, Russell, could you do something about reinits? Or, and I started calling all of my friends and asking them, would you write a chapter on what was your bit of expertise? And that's how the C sound book itself started. It still took five years. Uh, it still, as you guys know, has lots of stuff in there. But I was proud of one thing, that every chapter worked, except Barry's. Every chapter made sound uh, that, that in its entirety um, that, um, uh, that you had complete instruments in diagrams. Up to that point, you'd buy a book on acoustics or theory or electronic music. You'd read even the Curtis Rhodes book. And Curtis and I are great friends. I loved his book. I thought this was at last the compliment. But you know, you'd read all this great stuff about granular synthesis in Curtis Rhodes' book. And then you'd say, I guess that's what I'm doing. This must be it. I'm doing that. And I just thought, again, since musicians learn with their ears, if they had an instrument that was working, that they could start tweaking and, and modifying, that they would really get what they were doing. 
So for me, I was especially proud that the Seesaw book, everything worked, all the instruments ran in all 800 pages in the book and all 2,000 pages after. Um, uh, and and it's, it's been a goal, well, it's a goal that, that Victor and I strove for in the audio programming book. Same story there, worst story there. If I didn't think I was smart enough to, to know C sound, enough of C sound to write the C sound book, and I was pretty smart at C sound, imagine writing the audio programming book. It was like crazy. Thank God Victor came on and John came on, and, and these developers who are really making C sound great came on and helped me, helped me to sort of make that book happen. The thing that's great about our work together, though, is that when we take a look at this kind of manuals category, and I have basically that first document that started it all, one of the first ones, Max Matthews uh, article in like Science Magazine on the computer as a musical instrument. That brought Jean-Claude Rizet to Bell Labs. That got him to develop the Rizet catalog, which inspired my catalog, inspired Ian's catalog. Um, inspired a lot of people that computers could be musical. He invented wave shaping in that catalog, as many of you know, uh, one of the techniques that Rizé uh, uh, invented. Um, and so, um, but, you know, our new manual, I don't know, have any of you printed out the C-Sound manual? Even on two sides, it's this thick. It's amazing how thick the C-Sound manual is, which I love. I don't usually bring it into class, though. Uh, you know, because it's like, no, not because I can't carry it, no problem. You know, CSAM books, I've been carrying dozens of those all the time, you know, but, but and those are too heavy too. But um, it's quite amazing. I'll tell you just a fun little story with that. One day, because Barry Verko's manual is still this big, and Barry really stopped developing CSAM. He's added some things to his version, and he still has his version, which runs on the $100 laptops as well. But he really stopped adding things, new things to C-Sound. Oh, except this fixed point thing, which is very important and certainly would have helped us all make iPad versions of C-Sound. So Barry does have a fixed point version, which John knows very well. And, and John and I, some of us have the code to that. But, um, uh, but Barry hasn't released the fixed point version ever because, oh, well, I don't know why. Well, I think it has some proprietary analog devices code in it, to tell you the truth. But the bottom line is, um, Barry's manual is about this thick. You know, and that's nice. I like a small, quick thing. There it is. Boom. I sent one of my students over once because I often went over to MIT to teach C sound for Barry's students, which was also an honor. He'd always have me come and do like three weeks getting his kids going with C sound and C sound MIDI. And he taught out of the C sound book for many years, which was also really nice. But I sent one of my students over once. I said, listen, bring him a copy of the new manual, will you? <laughs> so the kid goes over with a book about this thick. And I said, and so, you know, make sure you sit it right beside his. <laughs> It made him hate the new seas out even more. You know, I was like, "All oh, that, what's all that stuff in there? We don't need any of that." And uh, um, so, uh, we need all of it. We need all of it. I don't. I hate when people. For some reason, it's sort of like you guys don't get a chance to watch American politics too much. Maybe you see a little of it, but you know, we absolutely have an amazing president. You know, he's brilliant. He's, you know, it's amazing. That first time in history, maybe. Uh, and, um, I mean, people have natural talents and natural brilliance, but this guy has both. And, uh, you know, amazing things have been happening, trying to fix a lot of things in the United States and in the world, in some ways, the world part, maybe we can all agree that hasn't been going so well, but in the U.S. especially. But what you hear on television all the time is so interesting because they get a kind of buzz phrase, maybe the Republicans do, or on Fox News, and so they get like a nasty buzz phrase, and that's what gets dropped all the time. So like they call it Obamacare. So it's like this negative thing. And so in any sentence you want to get down on, well, you know, he's wasting a lot of money with Obamacare. And, you know, and so there's like extra buzzwords like that. And so the buzzword in C-Sound that I don't like to hear is opcode bloat. It's one of those negative buzzwords that's crap. I love more opcodes. I always want more opcodes. Musicians want more opcodes. Please add 700 more filters, I'll be happy. Add 77 more oscillators. Add 500 different flavors of reverb. I would, I would be just happy to have more. So I'm glad we have a book like that. And I don't mind, now of course, when you have a K version of an oscill and an A version of an oscill, and they're kind of the same, well okay, there's ways of making it look better in the manual. But opcode bloat is our negative, politically negative word that limits our expansion and, and, and growth as a language and as a tool. So. Don't be throwing any of that opcode bloat at me anymore, John Fitch. I'm not going to stand for it. 
Now, um, so all I wanted to show you then in the end is maybe the things that we <coughs> would have talked about. Um, and then we'll maybe make a couple, I'll make one last point and play one last piece. I just want to make sure I actually don't leave anything out. You know, it started with the Dodge and Jerse book, which is a great book. And uh, I have now converted that whole book into C sound instruments, so it's really fun. There's the C sound book. There's Bianchini and Cipriani's fantastic book, Virtual Sound, a really great book, in some ways closer to what the Floss Manual is than the C sound book. Andrew Horner's Cooking with C sound, amazing. Um, Jim Aiken, as you guys have been reading on the list, I don't know if Jim is here or if he came, maybe he will, but Jim's working on a new book called C Sound Power, and he's really been pushing everyone, and I've always loved when Jim Aiken came on the list. I don't know if you know, Jim Aiken like started Keyboard Magazine. He's a legend. He's interviewed everybody. He has played every synthesizer on the planet that was ever invented because they wanted to write up in Keyboard Magazine. That guy has written more manuals for people. That guy has written more documents and probably written more words about the junk we play with and love and, and lust for than anybody on the planet. So the fact that he's writing a book in C-Sound and, and, uh, and sort of getting on us like, what's that really mean? Or how's that really work? Or what's that really do? is great because he's super focused on the uh, end user. And that's going to be great, C-Sound Power. Now what I've also shown up here is the C-Sound 6 book, which is coming. Um, uh, it maybe will be called the C-Sound 6 book, but maybe not. It's got to be something, again, maybe bigger because knowing you guys, there'll be C-Sound 7 before the C-Sound 6 book gets done or something. It would have been called the C-Sound 5 book, but I know 6 is going to hit before this is out. In any case, MIT Press is ready for the sequel to the C-Sound book. I'm having lunch with Doug Seary, my editor there, on Friday when I return that week. He's coming into Boston. Uh, well, I, I think he's even taking me to dinner at uh, uh, right near the press. So we're having a, a dinner where we're gonna talk about this. Victor and I are here. We're putting our heads together. Uh, we wanna put our heads together with you guys about what's missing and what needs to be in the next C-Sound book. It won't be as big. Um, and uh, but it will include a DVD that'll have a lot more stuff on it and there'll maybe be ways of having the book even expand in a floss like way to have it grow um, but uh, we've already brainstormed a little bit we're talking to John Fitch I'm not sure yet but I think that the three editors will be I'm not 100% sure this is carved in stone but I think it's going to be Boulanger, Lazzarini and Fitch will do the, the, uh, the will edit the news the newest C sound book more than anything, I want John Fitch's name on an MIT Press book. Um, he's just retired, which is great. This gives him time to write most of the book. Victor and I are going to just sit back um, and uh, just say, John, that's coming along. How, what, when's the next chapter getting done? And, um, but John Fitch really uh, uh, is, uh, has been why we have this tool. In 1990, uh, through a couple of friends, through an email pen pal, um, I was teaching C sound to a professor at Northeastern University who happened to buy a micro sound box. And they claimed a converter box that they could get C sound to run on it. And he contacted John and said, you, you know, John was there, they were talking on some mailing list. And John said, I think I could get an IBM version of that to run. I could probably get C sound to work on an IBM, a 486 machine. So we put in this uh, box in the card cage. We had four channels of 48K, beautiful converters, two channels of A to D. The box cost like $9,000. But to write a set of tutorials, believe it or not, my first set of toots bought me that $9,000 box. They gave me that box. I donated that box, I wish I still had it, to the Academy of Music in Krakow, where they have it in like an old analog room and it's still working there. Plus they have one of my old radio batons and some other synths, a whole room of Berkeley synthesizers. I smuggled them into the country. Now imagine this, you could never do it now. But I brought into the country with me, Berkeley had been updating their labs, so I brought in something like 14 DX7s, all in like duffel bags, all bubble wrapped. I had to rent a truck just to get to the airport. Now I got to the airport, some guy helped us. Now that gives me the creeps because the whole 9-11 thing came out of Boston. Some guy for some reason helped us smuggle all this stuff onto the plane, but not smuggle, but like, it was certainly extra bags. They were like bag after bag after bag of synthesizers and mixers. Golden DX7s, the original DX7 to the gold model, all kinds of stuff. Macintoshes, I brought over, when we took the wrapping off of the bags, it filled the basement of my friend uh, Mara Kornievsky's home. Now I didn't bring these over, smuggle. I had to smuggle them in because you can't take this stuff, it was a gift. 
from the Berklee College of Music to the Krakow Academy. It filled three labs in there. Plus they had synthesizers that they were able to give away to people to get plane tickets for their professors to travel to conferences and stuff. But um, um, uh, I'm telling you that story, why? Um, I don't know, I'll tell you later, it'll come back to me. In any case, the C Sound book is coming and uh, we're gonna talk more about that. And lastly, the most important things, like I said, are our CSAM magazine and journals. The other things that we wanted to talk about that we wouldn't are all of these phenomenal front ends and launchers. And good, it helps me raise one point. I've been doing a lot of work lately in music therapy. CSAM for music therapy. I'm gonna show you one little example of this. So we've been building some beautiful systems for kids, and both Takahiko and John, who you're gonna see in performance, have helped me develop all kinds of systems for iPads and, and that are working uh, with kids in these uh, special needs kids in special schools. But to show you that, just one glimpse of it really quickly, let's take a look at Andreas uh, Vidic's uh, Sound Emotion. So what Sound Emotion does is it uh, uses my video camera as a tracking device to allow me to um, uh, uh, play C sound instruments. So here's my camera. We'll sort of try to zoom to fit. We'll say start. And uh, the camera will come on. Here I am. And all these little squares are just like, uh, kind of like Big Eye, right? The Stein Big Eye system. We're doing it all in jitter. And um, uh, Max MSP in jitter. And by the way, C sound, till the Matt Ingalls work in C sound, we can't forget either. It's been incredibly important. So now if we turn on our audio see that I'm starting to now play. And we can shift different scales and, and play different modes and we can have presets that change this. We have Wiimotes controlling them. But you get the whole idea that it allows us to play and I could have samples triggered or whatever I want. Um, so now when you take something like that and you uh, put it into a therapy setting where let's say, oh sorry, uh, um, Let's say there's this little girl who's, we'll turn her up, Jamie. Now, she's wheelchair bound. I visited this clinic with her three times. She never moved once. We brought this system in and all of a sudden she's starting to play. And watch as she's playing it. This is our little video camera in front. She's figuring it out. You watch, she'll get a little tired and she'll actually end the piece. Watch what she does. She's done. She backs herself away like, let me back away from the camera. Now we didn't teach her anything. We just put it in front and said, try this. And she's just one of the kids. I mean, John has developed this amazing system with the uh, with the uh, iPads where these kids, again, with limited mobility are now playing C sound with touch controls. And this kid can only move his fingers. John's written a piece of software that scales the screen to just the size. It gives them full range. There's a little drum machine that's playing. It's a wireless technology. Mark was holding it as a doctor. He's studying C sound with me now. He's making all kinds of adaptive technologies. So here's a future for C sound too. But the reason I mentioned this and wanted to show it to you now without forgetting it is John Fitch's Win X Sound is the only launcher for C sound that works for visually impaired students. None of our C sound launchers talk, they don't use speak and text. None of them you can roll over and have it say what the things are or whatever. We haven't compiled our code to make them so that the blind or visually impaired can use them. We've got a whole big visually impaired setup at Berkeley now where they're doing MIDI with sonar and other program. They use the JAWS program. I had this kid study C sound with me. He was blind. It was a lot of work teaching him. He was amazing. He was doing sound design, instrument building. You can imagine he knows how an oscillator works in our oscillop code like nobody's business. And it was because he John's version of the program. So when I go to the front ends page of this talk, and by the way, I'll put the whole talk up for you afterwards so that you can pretend you heard me say all of this stuff. But you know, we've had some great front ends. John's wind sound is phenomenal. Gabriel Maldonado, Matt Ingalls. Matt Ingalls and Davis Pye on C-Sound tilde is incredibly important. Um, Michael Goggin's silent, Jean Pichet and Olivier Belanger's uh, Cecilia. Another point, I have to stop there. We'll talk about it later. 
but Cecilia is going away. The latest version, which was written, and it's beautiful, all in Python, is the last version that Olivier Belanger is working on, because now he's written his own Python synthesizer. You guys saw him say that in the mailing list. And so C sound, Cecilia is not going to talk to C sound anymore, unless one of us decide to keep maintaining Cecilia's C sound connection. Because he's going to make Cecilia just talk to his uh, Python language, but Cecilia is amazing. Audecker used Cecilia. Richard Devine used Cecilia. BT has used a ton of Cecilia. Like, you know, cutting edge, innovative electronic artists all do a lot of sound design with uh, Cecilia. You know, it's this beautiful kind of graphic tool that just kind of helps you think of C sound in a different way and build out of these sound graphs, and it's now doing a kind of granular. Uh, synthesis with, with this. The new version of Cecilia, all in Python, has all this post-processing. All of the faders are automatable and MIDI mappable. It's a phenomenally productive interface. It's about to leave C, C sound world. So we have to make sure that we uh, continue to treasure and nurture these things. Stephen Yee's Blue is amazing. We've been watching Rory Walsh's Cabbage uh, demos, which have been fantastic, uh, just uh, recently appearing. I can't wait to hear about Cabbage while I'm here. Can't wait to hear about Blue while I'm here. Stephen uh, Bonetti's WinX sound is awesome. It supports Python and Lua compilation. And why do I love Stephen Bonetti's uh, uh, WinX sound? Because he provides an Xcode project. And you know, for people who sort of have to have a Macintosh, because I know there's a whole thing, elite thing, about how Macintoshes suck and we shouldn't have Macintoshes and they're too expensive and they're ripping us off and now they rule the world. They're almost as bad as Microsoft because they made a great thing um, and so we have to hate them. Um, well, uh, uh, Berkeley is all Macintoshes. We have 5,000 students there. It's the largest conservatory in the world and every kid as part of their tuition gets a Mac and Oxygen, all kinds of software. And, uh, so, and there are a lot of places where people do use that thing and wouldn't it be nice to have an Xcode project file? Steven's been working on this, but it really is important. And, and uh, Stefano Bonetti does provide the source code of his version with an Xcode project, which I love. Um, uh, Oyvid Bretzig's Hadron and our new C-Sound for Live, I think, is going to be are, are already beginning to be game changers in that they're going to bring C-Sound to a larger community of just production-oriented uh, synthesis and electronic musicians, and I think that's certainly one of the future directions for C sound. Um, you know, like I was saying before, our instrument collections, Ian's is amazing, Andrew Horner, we can't forget him, his Chinese instruments are absolutely the best uh, 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 things uh, that sound like things in the C sound universe. I'm sorry. You may not think, they're the most expressive, best sounding C sound instruments. If I want to play C sound for my mom, she's not going to get trap and convert. She does, because she's heard it enough. But, I mean, she kind of gets it. And my granddaughter was just born at that Barry Virgo Memorial concert. I was actually playing my C sound instrument. So the first concert uh, that she heard was uh, sort of this trapped stuff. So that was kind of nice. I thought, good. We'll see what happens now to her, starting that music instead of Barney, I Love You song. Um, in any case, uh, those are great guys, as you know, that are really important. Um, lastly, uh, all of our manuals and tutorials, I've told you they're crucial. The Floss Manual is huge. Thank you again so much for that. And so what I'd like to do is I'd like to end then with this final kind of point and tribute and piece, where, if you'll allow me, can I have five more minutes? Is that okay? I can stop now or I can have five more minutes. Let's take a vote. Five minutes or stop? Okay. Was it fine? Thanks. So what I want to talk about then is where we came from and where we're going and why we came from there and how we've survived and why it's so important. So this is here comes PDP-10. There's are the giants. Um, this is 1979 when I wrote Trap. I was working on sound synthesis. These were the machines we used. And it's this idea of friendship and this incredibly strong bond between these four and now some of us that are the reason that maybe there hasn't been a conference, but CSound has survived and grown. When um, Max Matthews had his memorial, you know, this is him and I teaching the radio baton. 
and uh, one of the earlier ones, one of his earlier designs. Not so nice as this. This was built by Tom Oberheim, and in fact, uh, the one I have in my as my backup. I'm not playing it today. It's called the Boulanger. Max and Tom dedicated baton number one to me, so it, it actually has a name, but it's been misbehaving. Leave it to that. Um, you know, this is Max with one of my students, and the idea that the future of C sound isn't ours, but it's what we do with our students. You'll see some of mine tonight. Your students should be here with you next time if they're not with you here already. Um, your students' music should be your highest priority to present and share and not your own. Um, your students' work, they need to be on your publications. They need to be published with you. We need to use the opportunities that we didn't get um, to share uh, what we now have so that our language can live and our work can live, and both through friendship and through our students. That's the future of CSAM. So what I'll play for you is, to end, is conducting with friends at sea. On Max Matthews' 80th birthday, I went back and took the Rizé instruments, because he loved Rizé. I took the Chowning instruments, I midified them from my CSAM catalog, and I made a piece that Max could play on his radio baton in uh, C sound. And then I took the Pierce instruments and the Bowen Pierce scale for the third movement. Um, and I'll just actually give you a little taste of the, the three. But what you'll recognize is um, uh, uh, what you'll recognize here is the you know our classic C sound. These classic instruments, and that's the other most important thing. Miller Puckett was at the lecture, and I was using C Sound for Live with Ableton Live and jamming and joking with Scotty Verco that he and I could start a lounge act now. We could play. Maybe Barry could join us. Barry was a trumpet player, by the way. And when he was a kid, he played in a combo with his dad, played weddings. Well, I grew up playing weddings, too. That's why I'm such a talker and a con man. You know, it's like, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. It's arpeggio. We're taking a request, but we're happy you're here, and I hope, uh, hope you're enjoying yourselves. So we got the whole deal. Barry had it, too, in fact and uh, uh, gig most of his uh, young life as a, a, a wedding musician. Um, Paul Lansky, too, was a gigging wedding musician, uh, and Milton Babbitt as well. So we're in pretty good company. Um, but uh, uh, let me just uh, play you uh, uh, a little bit of this. Um, uh, and um, fortunately, I did get to play this for Max. He did get to play it some. Uh, it was his 80th birthday celebration. I'll show you the picture from that uh, in a second. Um, so, I think I can do it even better like this. Hold on. told me how to use these shell scripts to run bunches of C-sound things. So the first movement is Rizé. You'll hear the Rizé catalog instruments, some of his bells, some of his drums. Um, so uh, let's see. If this doesn't work, we'll stop here. And if it does, we'll continue. So here's the Rizé movement. You recognize his drums? <laughs> they were terrible drums, but they grow on you.
So the important thing is that, you know, it's up to us to kind of, you know, really stay together on top of things to try to uh, uh, develop and continue to develop. And that's what this conference is about. That's what this conference will help us to do more than anything. And this was the four of us at the premiere of this. Max was still alive. As you know, he passed away this past spring. Uh, we were supposed to be in China, like next at the end of the month. We were going to perform there. John Chowning is going instead. I was invited to be there with John. I won't be. But um, uh, so this is us now. John Pierce had passed. The song that I played you at the very beginning, I sang at John's memorial. And the piece that we'll play to end the concert tonight, I played at Max's memorial. So. We'll talk and see and think a little more about Max later, but you know, God, if anyone's a great role model for what we should be thinking and doing, it's him and it's these guys. So first of all, thanks again, Joaquin, for inviting me. Thank you all for your patience and your uh, interest in CSOUND and your support, and thanks for listening so attentively to this talk, and uh, I hope we have a great weekend together, and maybe we'll see you back at the concert. So thanks a lot, everyone. <laughs>